Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, it's pretty strange. Uh, you know, we have a kind of unusual president right now. Um, I'm sure we'll have something more to discuss about him. But he came in and he proposed a big slash of aid because that's the kind of uh, crude populism that uh, he represents. And even the Republicans, which are not you know, normally the great defenders of aid completely rejected the proposal for deep cuts. And that already tells you something, that there's still a shred of decency in the United States. Not, not a lot uh, in Washington, but there still is some, and there still is some awareness that, um, that aid is part of the most basic level of holding the world together. There are people that are suffering. There are people that are extremely poor. If we don't help them, they die. Or their societies uh, become uh, completely vulnerable to disease or to conflict or mass migration. So the world's not very generous about any of this. Even the ultimate standard, which the UK fulfills now, is less than 1% of income, so oh, it's not heroism exactly to reach 0.7%. 0.7, 70% 7 of 1% is taken to be the standard. And there are five or six countries that reach that and no others. Uh, and the five or six is that the Netherlands is sometimes up and sometimes down these days. But it's normally Denmark, Norway, Sweden, uh, Luxembourg uh, and the Netherlands that have been the five to reach the 0 0.7 of national income. Again, a pretty modest standard of aid. And uh, the UK, all parties adopted the 0 0.7 and, and uh, to David Cameron's uh, great credit, uh, they got that through and it remains the, the law of the land and it remains the practice of, of the UK. So I believe that it's the most minimal standard for the world. And all the debate about aid I find pretty, um, pretty lame, actually. Because within a country, you don't say, should we give less than 1% to the poorest of the poor, even the nastiest places in the world, and I live in one of the nastier places, uh, understands that you don't just leave people to, to die in general. Uh, I mean, it's a horrible thing. And so you spend some money for transfers. But then when it comes to the international scene, then my profession, the economics profession, spends 50 years debating 0 0.7, nah, 0 0.2, maybe. All, in my view, a completely misplaced thought, because what is good to debate, you asked me the right question, uh, how should aid work? Not should we have it, but what would actually be a good uh, practice for this? And I'll tell you, and just then stop my monologue, uh, my favorite kind of aid over the last 15 years has been aid to control epidemic diseases, especially AIDS, TB, and malaria, from a fund called the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. And the reason I like it is that it's very straightforward. The donors put their money into one pool, and countries submit national proposals. And those proposals are technically reviewed. And if they're technically sound, then the money is given, and then the program is audited, was it followed through? And it has worked to bring those disease epidemics under control quite substantially. And so it has a lot of features that I like. One is that the country is the one in the lead. It says, here's what I need. Second, its aid is viewed as a contract, which I think is the right way to view it. It's not charity. It's not do what you want with it. It's not steal it if you like. It's, look, we're going to give you something, and you're going to use it well, and we're all going to be satisfied as a result of this, so it's professional. 
Third, as I mentioned, the plans are reviewed by an expert committee, not by politicians. It's not a political decision. It's just, will this policy that is being submitted for funding actually work to control AIDS or to control malaria or TB? And I like that standard because I don't believe in aid as political conditionality. We'll give you the money if you run your election the right way. I don't even really believe in it for human rights. You know, we'll give it if you obey human rights. I don't believe one country can really run the politics of another country. I think it's presumptuous. I think it's arrogant. But I do believe that resources can help poor people get out of poverty or to stay alive, which is, in my view, not dependency or arrogance, but just functional approach of, and respectful approach. And so I believe that the right conditions for aid should be, will this work to satisfy the reasons that the aid is being given, and that the reason should not be political reasons, because I don't think that works, but should be technical reasons in the sense of disease control and so on. And I'll just, sorry, one last point. I've been in the room many times with uh, heads of state of developing countries and maybe the IMF comes in or the World Bank or somebody else comes in and they make all sorts of demands. Maybe even I agree with the demands, but I don't agree, I mean, I agree with the, what they're advocating, but I don't agree with the demand per se. And then the door shuts and the leader looks at me and says, who do they think runs this country? Because it's inherently very arrogant, I think, to believe that you can run the politics of some other country, even if you're a rich, powerful, outside country. And the truth is, you can't, actually, anyway. So bottom line, aid's really important. If it were 5% of our national income, it would be better. If it were 1%, it would be sane and civilized. The United States, I should have mentioned, we're not at 0.7, we're at 0.17. So we're at one-fourth the level. We're the nastiest, stingiest country because we have to save all that money for drone missiles to bomb these places instead because they're all unstable. So the only solution to instability is bomb them. As It's kind of stupid. <laughs> Just, just touching on, on that last point, it, it's, uh, a lot of people try and look to the US as, as um, the role model and, and the, the country Don't that do that be. anymore. Well, <laughs> so so my, my exact question was, is, are, are you cynical uh, given November's election that the uh, US um, is, is increasingly now going to be a, a, a bad role model? Are you cynical about the future prospects of the US to sort of play that role? Uh, and would you, would you try and tell everyone here to actually, yeah, like you say, not use the US as a role model? I'm not cynical, I'm accurate. <laughs> the US is not a role model, God forbid, and uh, it's actually, unfortunately, a dangerous country right now, a very dangerous country. And I don't say that lightly, and I don't say it flippantly. Do not elect Donald Trump to anything. Um, he is psychologically unstable, he's sociopathic, um, and he has uh, no business being anywhere near power. So that's a bad thing. But even before Donald Trump, the US was unfortunately, it had kind of lost the direction. And I was not a great fan of Barack Obama's foreign policy, except in some particulars like the Iran nuclear deal. But Barack Obama continued the war in Afghanistan. He signed up a secret war in Syria, because don't believe that's a civil war. That is a CIA Saudi war to overthrow Saddam Hussein, which failed and created misery and mass refugees and a European crisis and many other things, but it was a war to overthrow a government. Not one that I like, but I don't believe in the CIA overthrowing governments, period. Barack Obama 
joined the war, not only joined, well, he, Cameron, and Sarkozy uh, decided to overthrow Gaddafi in 2011. That was a dumb idea also, because whether you do it in a covert operation like uh, the Saudis and the CIA tried in Syria, or you do it uh, by NATO bombing, as uh, happened in Libya, the result is bound to be terrible because you'll open up a political vacuum, you'll create the conditions for civil war, for massive gun running, for a spread of violence to places like Mali, which happened. And so that was, again, Obama. We're in the war in Yemen because the Saudis begged us to be in the war in Yemen because the Saudis pay a lot of things in the United States so we do what they want, which is not a good idea for them or for us. And so the United States ceased to be a role model a long time ago. And it is not the indispensable country. It is not the world's sole superpower. None of that. It is a big, rich, militarily hyper-armed country that has a lot of bad foreign policy instincts and needs a good course in geography from the Oxford Geography Department. Uh, be, because uh, Americans don't know, I have a rule which I, I will quote myself, uh, which is that you're not allowed to bomb a country if you can't name two cities in it. Uh, because uh, my view is that that would lead to world peace. Uh, but it certainly would stop all American bombing. <laughs> G given everything you just said about uh, the United States, why is it that you, your, your, your main role at the moment is as special advisor to the uh, UN Secretary General? Do you not ever think that actually your, you could best have an impact by focusing your attention on a, trying to advise and, and getting into the administration in America and <coughs> using those, those skills to... to uh, Not this Is the UN a little bit safe, sure. perhaps? Uh, it's interesting. You know, I, when I started my career, which was a long time ago, uh, back in 1980, and when I was even studying as a graduate student, but really, uh, after my wife who's here, and I uh, went backpacking in India in the late 1970s and saw the development challenges, and I got really convinced that this was just the most interesting and important thing I could work on and wanted to work on was questions of poverty and, and development. I remember very distinctly saying to myself, well, I'm an Amer first, back in 1980, I said to myself, I'm an American economist, and that's good, I'm really proud of that. I will go out and I'll help the world and I'll be an American economist and America's good. Uh, we made the Marshall Plan and so forth. And I believe that, by the way, then. And uh, even though I had grown up during the Vietnam War period and Vietnam War was a really dumb, stupid, obnoxious, horrific, war of choice by the US. So it got everything wrong as we've done many times since then. But anyway, just to give you the mindset, I thought, okay, this is a pretty good country and, and I'm proud to be an American and I'm gonna go help fight poverty. And I said to myself sometime, I don't remember exactly when, but I said, I don't really have to work on the US because we're rich, it's the problems of economics though I was trained, I am a macroeconomist, whether we grew at 2% or 2.4% or 1.8%, even though when you look at that, that's trillions of dollars maybe. It didn't interest me that much because what difference would it make? You're rich, you're comfortable, a little bit more, a little bit less didn't seem to me to be the captivating issue on a planet where people are dying because they're in poverty, for example. 
So I said to myself, I don't have to work on the United States, thank goodness, and I'm gonna work abroad. And I did that for basically uh, 30 years. And starting in the early 2000s, I started feeling not only is the United States not a role model, but it's really messed up. The domestic politics is mean. Uh, we got into a kind of jag that the highest calling of politics is tax cuts for rich people, which started with Ronald Reagan, and we've been doing that now for 36 years, and this is the great dream and obs obsession of the Republican Party that they're gonna try to pull off again in the worst possible circumstances next month. So we've got a big brawl ahead politically in the United States. But things were really not going well. Not because the growth was only 2.3% versus 2.6%, that was the least of the problems. The most of the problem was America was nasty, it was unfair, our foreign policy was very violent. When we launched wars of shock and awe one day in March 2003 and just start bombing Iraq, that's madness. That's, in, I don't know whether it was insanity or crypto fascism or whatever it was, but it was incredibly awful. And then all through the period, I felt things were really, really off track. And then it became clear that America was actually in a health epidemic. We have, of course, the highest obesity rate in the whole world by far, and the mortality rate of white, non-minority, non white, non-Hispanic, middle-aged people, the mortality rate started to rise. And the reason I mentioned that it's white, non-minority is that it's kind of going to the, the core of politics, you thought, in the US, but the death rates started to go up because suicide epidemics, drug abuse, opioid epidemics, and so forth. Well, I did reach the conclusion, starting about seven or eight years ago, that the US was sufficiently messed up, I should work on it. <laughs> Not that I was gonna solve the problems, but that it really, I couldn't in good faith with myself just ignore all of that. I like my country. You know, I want it to do well. I don't diss it for the sake of being cute or controversial. And my family's there, my children are there, my grandchildren are there. So I don't want it to, to go bad uh, at all. So I wrote a book called The Price of Civilization in 2012, which was my first, quote, American book of trying to understand what's so messed up. And the idea of that title is a quotation from a great uh, justice of the US Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who said, I like to pay taxes, that's the price of civilization. A concept basically unknown to most Americans over the last 40 years. And I've spent more and more time worrying about the US, of course. I don't want to give up the other issues that I find compelling and important, and I remain advisor to the Secretary General of the UN, and I really treasure that, that role and that opportunity. But I'm more and more launching political activities in the United States, including on Monday, a set of goals like the Sustainable Development Goals for America where I'm really actively encouraging and we'll unveil them on Monday, um, uh, encouraging American politicians to get out of the rut of corruption, which is massive in the US because we have so much money. It's legal, but it's corruption nonetheless. Seven, eight billion dollars per federal election cycle right now. And that's money given by big powerful interests and a lot of nasty people to a lot of politicians who sell themselves on the cheap on the whole. So you can really buy the whole Republican Party for just a few hundred million dollars, which is what the Koch brothers have done. Um, so the idea is to unveil some goals that could be ways to reorient the country towards important things. 
And one of my abiding beliefs for good economics and good public policy in general is set some clear objectives, set some goals on the horizon, not for today or next year, but for 10 or 20 years from now for the work of the generation, and say, what could we achieve? Here's how we could form a path to actually build or rebuild a society and then work on that. So my hope is it's, a, it's actually going to be pretty active engagement politically, is that people of both politi major political parties, both the Democrats and Republicans, could sign on to a common set of goals as a kind of orientation for where we should go and to get out of the, really, the craziness that the most important thing in the world is to end the estate tax, which is, of, of course, the cut the Donald Trump family tax. Um, and we've got to come back to the idea that we need clear, shared aspirations above greed, which we don't have in the United States right now. <laughs>